Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Kunichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Mori Mori Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so honored and so wicked happy that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show, and please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Good Pod, Stitch Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Patricia Newman. She's returning to the show to celebrate a river's gifts, the mighty Elwa River Reborn. Before we invite Patricia back into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Latkes for Santa Claus, Janie and Mace's debut picture book, illustrated by the amazing Brian Langdo. It was a finalist in the 2022 International Book Awards, and it is a fantastic book. In this humorous and enduring story, blending both Christmas and Hanukkah, a little girl and her stepbrother compete to leave Santa the best treats ever. It's a joyful, engaging read, perfect for culturally blended families and delightful for all readers. The playful rhymes will keep kids giggling and Janie's family latka recipe included at the end is to die for. Watch for Janie's next blended holiday book, Easter eggs and matzo balls. It's coming January 2023. But in the meantime, be sure to get your copy of Latkes for Santa Claus by Janie Amaeus. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by How Can We Be Kind? Wisdom from the Animal Kingdom, written by Janet Hoffman. This special book asks kids a simple question How can we be kind? The answer is is by learning from the animal kingdom. Animals demonstrate kindness and empathy towards each other, and care and compassion can be seen all throughout the natural world. This book shows children the ways that they can be kind, just like their animal friends are to each other, while at the same time teaching them about the magic and the beauty of the natural world. They will absolutely love this book. This sweet and thoughtful book is both a celebration of the animal world and a manifesto for being kind in everyday life. It deserves a place in your family library. It's Get Your Copy Today. How Can We Be Kind? Wisdom from the Animal Kingdom by Janet Hoffman. And this episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Escape to Play. The beautiful picture book by Becky Garish. What could go wrong when three mischievous dogs slip out before dawn to explore the farm? Follow the pups as they make a mess in every new place they go. Playful poetry and whimsical illustrations create an upbeat feeling as you move from page to page. Be sure to keep an eye out for some special paintings hanging on the farmhouse walls. Escape to Play is a reminder to have fun with discovery. Art lovers and future art lovers will enjoy the back matter section full of tidbits and questions. The back matter section offers easy to read information about the art that was sprinkled throughout the book. You're going to love this book and you're going to love finding the little mouse that's hiding on every page. Get your copy today, Escape to Play by Becky Garish. Join us right now from Sacramento in the great state of California. Our guest is returning to the show. She's one of our very first guests here on the podcast and has been with us a number of times. Please welcome back to the show the author of A River's Gifts, The Mighty Elwa River Reborn, Patricia Newman. Hey, Patricia, so good to see you. Hey, it's great to be back. Yes, we've we've had such a great time speaking to you about all the wonderful STEM-related books that you've written over the years, and I can't wait for you to tell us all about A River's Gifts. Good. That's I'm very excited to talk about it. It was released just about a month ago now, and um, it has two starred reviews already, 
And I'm very, very excited about this, not only because it's a fabulous story of restoration in, in nature, but because it's a little bit of a different style for me. You, you might have noticed that when you compared it against my other books, mm-hmm, Jen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We're um, discovering that a lot, of, a lot of our first guests were STEM authors, Jennifer Swanson, Patricia Yu, um, Laurie Walmark. And it seems like all of you are kind of branching out right now. You know, Jennifer and Laurie wrote picture books, their debut picture books, and Laurie's uh, very unstem book, the uh, uh, Dino Pajama Party. Um, what is it that uh, – is it just kind of you, you wanted to stretch your, your creative muscles? I think a little bit is is stretching our creative muscles, but – I think what some people forget is behind the scenes, authors are always working on a number of different projects. What you see is what has sold so far. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, so it sometimes takes a while to kind of break out of what you have been selling and get an editor to take a chance on you for something else. Um, In terms of A River's Gifts, the same editor that has published Planet Ocean and Eavesdropping on Elephants and uh, Plastic Ahoy and Zoo Scientists to the Rescue also published A River's Gifts, which is kind of cool. She took a chance on a different format from me, a different voice, if you will. Uh, it's still a middle grade story, but rather than um, a lot of text, usually my books have about 6,000 words in them. This book is much more lyrical. So um, it was it was fun to be able to work with the editor on an illustrated book that had a completely different feel to it um, and, and know that it could be a success. Mm, that's fantastic. So tell us uh, about the uh, River's Gifts. This is based on a real river that exists up in Washington State. Yes, it is. This river has been nourishing the um, ecosystem for millennia, literally millennia. And um, the main wonderful thing about this river is its salmon. Um, it f- starts in the Olympic Mountains in um, near the Olympic, in, I guess in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. And it flows north to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which leads out to the Pacific Ocean. The salmon, uh, um, there are five different kinds of salmon in the Elwha River, and they have their various times when they come back to the river to spawn. If you know anything about salmon, you know that they're one of those fish that um, are born in a river environment, grow up a little bit, swim to sea, spend the bulk of their lives at sea, uh, um, in uh, eating marine fish, um, Uh, ingesting marine nutrients, and then when it's time for them to spawn, they return to the river in which they were born, and they spawn and they die. Their bodies, as they, you know, rot Mm -hmm. on the shore, if you will, decompose on the shore, give all of those marine nutrients that they'd been ingesting for all those years into the soil for the trees and the bushes that feed the elk and the uh, deer and the mice and the and the bears. Salmon um, are wonderful food for bears. They uh, fish them and and um, catch them a lot of times when they're jumping out of the water. When um, the Native Americans came to this river, they they're, they call themselves um, the Strong People. Uh, now their their um, I guess official title is the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe. But their name in their language, in their clown language, still means the strong people. Um, they have reports from elders generations ago where the salmon were so thick in the Elwha River, you could practically walk across the river on them. Wow. So um, this river was a an, an, uh, source of abundance for the area. Then what happened in the uh, 1800s? Settlers arrived, they they built their towns, and one settler in particular, Thomas Aldwell, came to the area and saw the power of the Elwha River 
and convinced the town to make uh, build a dam to provide electricity. And dams historically are clean sources of power. It was it was a pretty good idea. It was something that was happening all over the United States, except. Even though there was a state law in Washington that said all dams must include fish passage, Mm -hmm. for some reason, the state of Washington waived that law for Thomas Aldwell and his dam. So the first dam, the Elwha Dam, was built without fish passage. And then later, another dam um, closer toward the headwaters called the Glines Canyon Dam was built. And it, of course, didn't have fish fish passage either. But by that point, it was moot because the fish couldn't get beyond the Elwha Dam. Mm -hmm. So anyway, as you might imagine, the salmon, which are the rich source of abundance for this river, did not return. And the ecosystem began to change. And the strong people began to suffer. Their things like their creation site were flooded Because, you know, when you put a dam in a river, you make a lake behind it. Mm -hmm. And that's what provides drinking water. And and that's how the dam operators regulate the flow. And um, sometimes the flow was so light that what fish were in the river were gasping for air. And sometimes the flow was so heavy that the downstream lands were flooded. So um, (laughs) a, a really fortuitous thing happened. The Olympic National Park grew, and all of a sudden, the Glines Canyon Dam, the upper dam, was now in the boundaries of this national park. And when it came up for renewal, the uh, the regulatory commission that controls such things says, oh, no, we can't renew this because it's on uh, national park land. So that gave the strong people and other concerned citizens the idea that Let's take these dams down. They had become older and obsolete in the hundred years since they were erected. Mm -hmm. And it was a long fight. It was a, you know, 20 year, 20 plus year fight, but they finally did it. They removed the dams and the ecosystem is restoring itself. So for a change, (laughs) you know, I always say we have a happy conservation story, Jed, Mm -hmm. instead of gloom and doom, right? Yeah. Isn't, nature amazing that when we step away and stop actively harming it, it very oftentimes can heal itself. Yes. Yes. Nature will recover. We just have to step out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that you wrote to me in preparing for this interview was you hoped that the book would help kids become more grateful and that your thought was that if kids are more grateful that they're more likely to preserve what we have. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I just wrote an essay about gratitude um, in environmental education. I, I sincerely believe that when you teach kids the why, why does nature work the way it does? Why do we have oxygen from the ocean? Why are salmon so important to the Elwha River? Why uh, is coral bleaching such a bad thing? Um, Why is uh, the forest of Africa such an important place, not only for elephants, but for people? These are all all questions that I've addressed in my books. And And I believe when children know the why, they can understand how nature works for us. And you can't help but feel gratitude when you stand on the shore and realize that little tiny phytoplankton, the grass of the sea, have been making oxygen billions of years longer than animals and plants on land. The ocean is the reason we live on Earth. We can live on Earth. So when we start to feel that sort of understanding and then Gratitude follows that understanding. I, th- I strongly believe that that then promotes action. Mm-hmm. It promotes a change in our behavior where we, um, instead of creating an environmental disaster like the Elwha River, we start to say, we start to make decisions rather that include nature. 
as we're as we're making the decision. So there, it might not be the cheapest option, mm -hmm. but in the long run, it will be the less costly option if we include nature in our decision making. Well, I I think that's a great lesson for kids to to understand. We've we've talked um, a, a fair amount here on the show about the fact that kids. And, and a lot of adults aren't financially literate because we don't talk to them about that. And I think one of the things that we can we can help our kids understand when we're making them aware of costs and how to make decisions around money, also just help them really evaluate, okay, well, well this action, it costs less today. But what's the long-term cost? Is it, is this going to cause a problem that we're going to have to spend a lot more money for later on? Is this uh, this action that we're taking right now going to cause us to spend in different ways on our health, on the different ways that that is hurting the environment? So I love this idea of talking to our kids, having an ongoing conversation with our kids about life and i think that books like a river's gifts helps us do that helps us look at how we're connected with the world and how we're so dependent on each other and also on the world exactly exactly and another reason i love uh, the story of a river's gifts it's it's also a story of environmental justice i mean really what the settlers did to the strong people, um, you know, uh, taking away their fishing rights, uh, flooding their creation site, which is a sacred place to them. Um, and, and even after all of this, the strong people didn't have electricity. Mm. The, the electricity wasn't brought to their homes. It was just to the settlers' homes in the town of Port Angeles. So um, when we start thinking about other people and and how our decisions affect them, then I think we become a society that is is not only caring, but is making the best decisions with all the factors mm -hmm. in mind. Mm -hmm. That seems unconscionable to me to to take and disrupt a people's way of living and then not allowing them to benefit from that. Exactly. It, it is unconscionable, but it happened all over our country time and time again um, with many, many, many Indian tribes. So, um, you know, is, is the strong people's story different? Maybe not. But the one thing that is different is that they took a stand. Mm -hmm. They took a stand, and they are the ones that made this happen. They, they worked with, they, they have, uh, in their natural resources department, they have scientists. They worked with governmental scientists. They worked with national park scientists. They worked with government officials. They worked with townspeople. They worked with the media. They made it happen. And it really was extraordinary. And, and not only did they make it happen, the, the national park service paid for it. Hmm. So it was really an extraordinary story. And there are a number, most people think that, oh, well, the Elwha, Elwha dams were removed, the, um, the two dams. But, you know, really nearly 1,800 dams have been removed since the early 1900s in the United States. And dams continue to be removed because many of them are old or unsafe. Many of them have terrible environmental consequences or um, power has been provided from other places now, more centrally located uh, places like the power for the Port Angeles uh, community, I think is from the Bonneville power dam, which is gigantic. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, a more centralized power source, but um, dam removal is not the odd thing. Mm -hmm. It's becoming more and more common as townspeople understand what rivers do to their environments. Mm. And a lot of us probably live in cities where we have paved a river channel or we have buried a river and paved over the, the channel that, that used to be the river. And 
all of a sudden we're dealing with flooding consequences. And that's because we have disturbed the natural ecosystem Mm -hmm. that had it under control long before we, we interfered. Yeah. I know here in Boston, there is a project that is actively restoring the muddy river, which feeds Mm -hmm. into the Charles and into the, into the Atlantic. How did you discover the story of the uh, Elwo river? Oh, that's a great story because, um, my husband is such a supporter of my work. I, I always say he's a patron of the arts. Um, and he loves to chat with his colleagues at work. And one day, I think it was a September day, he was chatting with one of his colleagues, catching up on her triplets. And one of the triplets had an internship on the Elwa River restoration. Mm. Um, restoring the lake bed, the lake, the dam had already been breached. The one of the lakes had been drained and all that was left was, uh, sort of a silt, like a moonscape because nothing had grown there Mm -hmm. for a hundred years. And, um, my husband's colleagues triplet, um, was, one of the volunteers that replanted the lake bed with hundreds of thousands of native plants. Each one had to be planted by hand. Mm -hmm. And this has happened on two different lake beds. So we learned about this story. My husband immediately came home and said, I have your next book idea. (laughs) And he's been, he's been around me long enough to know what a good book idea is. And darned if he wasn't right. (laughs) Well, that is wonderful to have that, that support and that, that person who has that confidence in, in you, who knows that you're going to be able to take this story and tell it in a way that's going to reach thousands of families and hopefully inspire them. Well, you know, he had a part, another part in the book as well. Once the book went to the printer and I turned my focus to promotion, I, I started to talk out loud, uh, you know, think out loud to him and say, you know, I, I really wish I had a child as the narrator for my book trailer. And he said, oh, another colleague of mine has a six-year-old. Maybe she'll help. <laughs> so she did. She's the narrator in the A River's Gifts book trailer. Yeah, yes. And I, I heard that book trailer, and she's an amazing reader for a six-year-old. Yes, she is. And she's an amazing voiceover narrator. Who knew that a six-year-old had such skills, right? I know. I know. I was very, very impressed. Um, Is there a story out there that you haven't been able to to tell yet, a a story that you are passionate about that you believe needs to be told? Yes. I was working on it yesterday, as a matter of fact. I've been working on a proposal uh, for my editor, because most of my books are for older mm-hmm. students, I, I mentioned they have a roughly 6,000 words. A, a River's Gifts is shorter, but um, most of my other uh, STEM books have around 6,000 words. I write a proposal ahead of time, which is, in essence, a sales document mm-hmm. with an overview and a, a section-by-section outline of what will be in the book and how will it be laid out and how will it flow. And my editor came back to me saying that "Mm, there's just too much here and we can't focus on any one group of people because I'm following an an ecosystem through time, Mm. through thousands of years of time uh, from the prehistoric peoples. And so I, I took that back and I'm, and I'm reworking it and trying to, focus the story. That's the one thing that nonfiction authors have the hardest time with is focus because Mm -hmm. the stories, the subjects that we write about are so big Mm -hmm. that we often have to leave out a a lot of information and really focus our attention on one small part of it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, I do have a story about some trees that are very important to me Mm -hmm. that I really would like to have told, but I have to keep working on it until I get it just right. Perfect. Perfect. 
Well, I wish you luck with that. Uh, all of your books are really inspiring, and they I, I really think they're great Great books for families, obviously for, for kids to read on their own, but as, you know, the, the, the title of the podcast is Reading With Your Kids, and I think that your books really lend themselves to being read together uh, or, or co-read and in, in, in families coming together to have conversations. And I think A River's Gifts is uh, just another in, in a, a long line of books that families can really sit down and have hours and hours of conversation about. I, I think that's right. I, I, I'm so glad you said that, Jed, because that's that's one of my aims is to open up conversation within families and have them maybe look at the world in a little different way that they haven't experienced before. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I, uh, one way I think that happens in A River's Gifts is through Natasha Donovan's art. She is from the general area. She has lived there all her life. And I think her love for salmon and moving water comes through in this book. You feel like the river is moving as you turn each page. It's colorful. It's beautiful. It's accurate. It's, it's moving. It's quite literally moving on an emotional level and on a physical level as well. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things families can talk about is as we move forward, we, as, as a people, our society runs on power. We need energy, but we don't need it at any cost. We need to take a look and evaluate what's the best way, what's the, the fairest way for us to get what we need so we can grow as a society, but also um, protect the environment. And also be fair with, and make sure that everybody is able to uh, benefit from these from these actions. Yes, exactly. What what I I love to leave with readers is that we are connected to mm-hmm. nature. Uh, nature does for us; we do for nature. We affect each other. We're we're part of this sort of this amazing cycle, this amazing process that happens on very small scales in our neighborhoods and our communities and on very large scales like the ocean. Mm -hmm. So probably the largest scale, Mm -hmm. right? So um, we are connected. Nothing happens in nature that doesn't also affect us. And I think the sooner that we sort of uh, understand that and feel that gratitude for it, the sooner we can begin to include nature in our decision-making and community planning. Absolutely. Well, I know, Patricia, people are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about A River's Gifts, The Mighty Elwa River Reborn, find out more about all of your past books, and maybe sign up for a newsletter so they can find out when that book about the trees is ready. Right, exactly. <laughs> Get in on that early, right? Yeah. <laughs> My website is Patricia M. Newman.com. Awesome. We've had a wonderful time speaking with the author of, of Rivers Gifts, The Mighty Elwa River Reborn. Our guest has been Patricia Newman. Hey, Patricia, thanks so much for being back with us. You are very welcome. Thank you for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. It's going to be an out-of-this-world episode with Jeffrey Bennett talking about the totality. Look all about solar eclipses. It's fascinating. want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, Patricia Newman. Please be sure to check out A River's Gifts, The Mighty Elwa River Reborn. I also want to thank our sponsors, Becky Garish, please be sure to check out Escape to Play. Janet Hoffman, her book, How to Be Kind. How, excuse me, How Can We Be Kind? And also, we want to thank Janie Emmaus. Please be sure to check out Latkes for Santa. I want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q, Jordan Saley. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. 
I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids podcast.